forest size is more than just a number. It's a measure of life, diversity, and carbon storage. Forest height is one of the most important vertical structure parameters, which is not only an essential element for studies on species composition, stand quality, and climate effects, but also a key parameter for simulating ecosystem service functions, forest fires, and forest biomass monitoring. It can really help determine the radial growth response to climate change of different forest types and heights, even though accurately measuring forest height can be challenging, especially in uneven terrain or dense understories. But we are so lucky that these days, thanks to satellite imagery and very smart scientists, we're able to do that. And one of the data sets that has recently come out is the ETH Global Canopy Height 10 meters. And in today's tutorial, we'll be leveraging this data set to create some awesome and important data visualizations. What's up, people? This is Milos. Welcome to my channel as I take you on another data visualization and geospatial journey with R. This time, we will be creating a 3D forest height map using ggplot2 and a ray shader. In specific, we'll be first of all loading the data on global canopy height from ETH for 2020. Then you will learn how you can uh, crop these files to the extent of Portugal. And finally, we'll be creating an, a pretty and effective 3D forest height map using Ray Shader. All right, guys, let's get started by first of all, installing and then loading the packages we need for this session. The first thing is to define the list of libraries that we will going to load. And if we don't have them, we're also gonna install them. The first one is the umbrella package called Tidyverse, which is a collection of very useful packages for data wrangling, such as dplyr, and data visualization, such as ggplot2, both of which we'll be using in this tutorial. The second one is the asset package, which helps us work with uh, polygons and also points and also lines, any kind of a shape files. In this specific tutorial, we'll be working with countries and regions. So it's really necessary that we have the asset package. Now, if you want to load countries or regions for any state in the world, you can use geodata package for that purpose. And we will be using this as well. A part of these three packages, there is one more, which is extremely important for us to work with raster files. And that is the Terra package, which allows us not only to load raster packages, but also modify them in different ways, which we will also demonstrate in this tutorial. And then finally, uh, there are two more packages that we want to load. One of them is uh, actually uh, one that I like to use for creating breaks and legend breaks. Um, and finally, uh, we will be creating also a 3D map here. So for that purpose, we'll be loading a ray shader package. Now, one thing we need to check is, are these among installed libraries? So we're going to create object installed libs. And then we, using this list of libraries, we're going to go through the row names of already installed packages on our computer. So here we're going to search through install packages. Now, if these libraries are not already installed, we need to install them. So here we're going to put an if statement. We're going to say here if any of these installed libs equals false. So in other words, if it's not there, then we just install them here. So we say install dot packages and then we don't install all the packages, but only those that are not present in the libs list using this install libs. And the way you say that something is not there is using this exclamation mark. Now that we have installed those packages that we don't have, the time is ripe to also load all the libraries now. And because here we have a list of libraries and the list is in libs, we do need to use l apply here. So we need to apply a library function, which actually calls the libraries. And then here we also want to use character dots only equals true and uh, we're just going to wrap everything here into invisible 
So this is how you do it. And after this, after you run all this, so we will be installing libraries that are not already present and then loading all the libraries and then we can kick off our session with data wrangling. Recently, I've been browsing around Twitter and minding my own business when I bumped into this very interesting post announcing a new Forest Heights global data set, which is based on our deep learning methods using Sentinel-2 and GEDI data. And it goes all the way to 2020 and it has a very actually nice resolution of 10 meters, uh, which compared to GLAD is way, way crisper. So I decided to give it a try. So I went to Google and I searched for ETH Global Canopy Height for 2020. And I actually found this GEE, which stands for Google uh, Earth Engine Community Catalog, which enlists exactly the data set that was referred to in the Twitter post before. And uh, here I found uh, a bit more information about the data set itself, why it is so important. Uh, but it seems that its um, contribution actually lies in the fact that combines together this uh, GEDI with Sentinel-2 to actually develop this deep learning um, model that would allow us to have uh, a global uh, canopy heights, but also some kind of uncertainty estimates around that for every, you know, uh, place in, on the Earth. And it has a very high resolution of 10 meters. So if you actually scroll down, you will also see a small demo uh, of the level of detail. And it's, I would say it's pretty impressive. Um, and you can also find here uh, some links to the global or the Google Earth Engine itself, which we are not going to go into. For us, the most important thing is actually this link here, which suggests that we can also access uh, specific tiles for specific locations. So we click here and then to my disdain, I was horrified to actually see this a very, very old structure of files. And I was thinking to myself, where do I find now tiles? But there is this link at the bottom of this page called tile index HTML. So I click here and voila, I got the OSM overlay with also uh, tiles for each of the locations on Earth. So I was overjoyed with this because I didn't have to deal again with those pesky files without any meaning and I could not really extract you know for a specific location but now everything was fine uh, even there was a, this nice open street map overlay so I could definitely see what's going on and I was specifically interested in Portugal in this case because I read somewhere about this rare eucalyptus trees which can have a height of like tens of meters so I really wanted in this tutorial to cover Portugal maybe some regions also of Portugal and I found here actually tiles that belong to Portugal. So if you actually, uh, you can notice here that there are at least six tiles that uh, belong to, to Portugal. But if you actually scroll, uh, zoom in a bit, you will notice that this one actually captures only parts of, of Spain. So essentially we have here, uh, we have here five. So we have five. So uh, one, two, three, four, and five. Now there is not an easy way to download this in, I mean, there is actually, it's about clicking. So if you click here in one of them, you have two links. Now, uh, as this title suggests here, the first one, which is CHM, this is what we need. So this is the canopy height. The other one is the standard deviation. So this is the measure of a certainty that they also provide. So we need only then the first link here. So this one. So because there is no straightforward way to uh, basically determine exactly the names of each of these that we uh, you know, need, uh, apart from manually just you know, like copy and pasting. So I suggest that for this purpose, we simply like, okay, click on each one and just copy this somewhere in some notepad. I copied all those links here and I created a new object URLs, which is a list of those five. And as you can see, each of these URLs, I put them under the quotes, which means I turn them into strings so that R can you know, work with them and use them to download the raster files. And you can also see that I separated each element of this list with comma as you should always do. Now that we have this, we now simply need to write a for loop, which will take each of these 
strings and then issue a call to download them to your local drive. So the way to write a for loop in R is pretty straightforward. So we write here for URL in that list of URLs and then we open this curvy brackets. And then within this, we can write our command and the command is download file from base R. Within this one, we specify that we want to download each of the URLs. We also specify that we want to have the name or the destination of this uh, each file to be the base file or base name of the file of URL. And then finally, we also want this to be downloaded as the binary, uh, binary mode, which in R is WP. Once you run this, of course, first of all, define this list of URLs. And then once you run this, you will, uh, the download will start. And we are talking here about a few hundred megabytes. So give it some time. Once we download that, uh, we can actually inspect whether we got all those five raster files that we wanted. So the way to inspect things is using list.files from base R. So here we can then first of all specify what is the pathway that you want to check. Well, if you want to check the main pathway of your working directory, then you can call this get working directory command. The second thing you want to check is some kind of a pattern because it can happen that you have more TIFF files here or actually more files under similar names. So what you can do here is, for example, one of the things that you can notice from those links is, yeah, ETH, ETH as the creator. So you can use that pattern. What is the likelihood you might have some other files with the ETH, right? Anyways, there, that's one of the things that we can check. And then the second thing, or the third thing in this one, you want to grab full names of these files. So not just the name, but also along with the pathway to those file names. And because we are gonna use this list of these raster files later on to load them into R, I will create here an object called raster files and wrap everything up in it. So once you run this, you should be able to see, you know, a list of file raster files. So let's check quickly if that's really the, the case here. So as you can see, we have five raster files. So these are based on those links. And now we can uh, finally load these things into R. Because we want to crop only the for a site area for Portugal, we do need to first of all define the shapefile of Portugal or the national boundaries of Portugal. For that, we'll be using Geodata. And the reason why I'm using Geodata here is this package also allows you to load lower administrative levels. So the sub-state levels or regions or districts or whatever you can imagine here. So this is what we're gonna be doing here. And I'm doing this only for the purpose that will also allow you then to grab only the data for a region itself and not for the country itself. Sometimes you might be more interested in, you know, forest high dynamics on the regional level. So let's write a function, which is gonna be called um, get, get uh, country orders. Okay, um, and then within this one, we will call the geodata package. But first of all, let's define the main path. And the main path will be the pathway to our working directory. The next thing is let's fetch those country borders. All right, so as I said, we'll be using geodata. Geodata can access this GADN, which is the Global Administrative uh, Divisions. Uh, and this one offers you, as I said, for any country in the world, depending on the number of substate levels it has. So for Portugal, we can just take the first substate level, uh, which are regions. So first of all, you need to specify here a country. And country here means country with the ISO 3 code in letters. For Port Portugal, this one is PRT. For other countries, something else you can check out online, what is the ISO 3 code for the country that you are fetching data for. The next thing is the level. Now, if you want to get here only the national boundaries of Portugal, you're not interested in any substate level, you should choose a level zero here. 
but I want to show you in this tutorial how you can get also lower levels. So let's say level one. And then also how you can filter those levels and maybe then crop only for those levels the poor side area. And finally here, you should define the path to which you want to download because this will actually download the shape files on your local drive. But don't worry, it's not as big as those, you know, forest height uh, raster files. So the path here or the pathway is going to be this main path object that we defined. And that's almost it, except for one thing. And this is once you download this, this is going to be in a RDS format, but we want this to be in SF format. So here we need to do one small transformation, uh, which is using the SF package and especially ST as SF function. So this function will convert any foreign object into SF object. In other words, anything that is not SF is going to go into SF once you apply this. All right. And once we do this, we can simply return uh, this country borders object that we created and outside of this we can then you know uh, we can just call country borders object so uh, that's actually how you do it using the geodata package and using its gadm uh, function so once we actually run this uh, we will get locally this these files but they're also going to be stored in this country borders and then i'm going to show you what are they actually the regions, how this looks like, and how you can actually filter out specific regions from this and maybe use after that to crop that forest area. Notice how Portugal is partitioned into these regions, but it also has this tiny islands, Azores and the Madeira Island. So we didn't really download the data for them and they're also a bit off. So I will show you now how you can filter them out. To filter out those islands, we first need to inspect what are the names that we are after. And to do that, you can simply call base R function called unique, which will going to give you the unique values from your specified column. So in our case, we're going to search for country borders. And there is one called name one, which is actually names of the administrative level one polygons. So if we run this, this will going to give us the following thing. So uh, it's going to give us 17, 18, 19, 20, so 20 regions. And as we said, we want to uh, get rid of Azores and we want to get rid of uh, Madeira, which is number 13 here. So these are the two islands. So how do we go about this? So first of all, we're going to um, create a new object, which is going to be called Portugal SF. And this one is going to filter those country borders that we already uh, created. Then we're going to use dplyr from tidyverse uh, and its option filter, which is going to allow us to filter out objects. Now, let's say, for example, that you only want to uh, filter one region here and you're not concerned in this tutorial with actually doing uh, any kind of analysis on the Portugal itself. So how would you do that? Well, pretty easy. So you will go with this name one and then equals and then name of the region from that list that we had. As simple as that. So that would give you only the polygon for that region. So how do we go then about uh, when we have actually more regions? So we don't we cannot really go for this equals two because it's going to give you only the one of the elements. So then in R, you actually use this symbol. So you use percentage symbols to wrap around in. This will allow you to look through a list of more items. So in our case, we do have two regions that we want to remove. So that's why it's very convenient to use this uh, function here. So in. And as we said, the first one is uh, Azores Islands. And the second one is the Madeira. Now, thing with this one is this is going to select only those two, but how do we filter them out? Pretty easy. You only need to put exclamation mark before name one, and this is going to uh, include all the polygons except these two Azores and Madeira. So if you want to work only with certain polygons, this is how you do it. From now on, though, we're going to work only with the Portugal uh, polygon without the Azores and Madeira. And this means I want to erase those original boundaries because I don't need them anymore. So how do we do that? How do we collapse those boundaries and just have 
one single boundary of Portugal. It's actually quite easy. We uh, just need to use ST union from the asset package. It's basically going to union all those regions into one. It's going to collapse them and we won't have any internal borders within Portugal. We're just going to have the borders of Portugal. So if we run this, this is exactly what's going to happen. So I'm going to show you next what we get after we run this. Ta -da! So we have Portugal with all those islands and now we can move on and finally crop those raster files using this Portugal polygon. To load the raster files and then to crop them, we need to do several things. So bear with me, this is going to be a bit more complicated because we are loading several raster files. But here is in a nutshell what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to load all of those raster tiles. Of course, they are going to go over the Portugal borders. So the next thing we need to do is we need to crop each of these tiles to the Portugal borders. Once we have them, they're going to be stored in a list. So we want to put actually them together into a single object. And for them, we're going to create then the mosaic. Once we have the mosaic, then we're going to be able to optimize it a bit because the resolution will be too high for Ray Shader to do uh, anything with it. So let's go. The first thing is to actually load these uh, raster files in a list. The reason why we do that is that in a list, it's easier to work with them to transform crop whatever you want. So here's the thing. So first of all, we're going to create an object which is going to be called forest height list so that we just know, you know, what's going on here. And then we are going to use uh, L apply. We're using that because we want to, uh, you know, load the list of raster files and we want to store them into a list. So uh, we're going to use here raster files that we previously uh, defined, as you remember. And this is where we have, uh, you know, those those five files. And then we're going to apply to them Terra Rust function, which is basically just going to load them into a list. All right. Once we have this, then we need to do a bit more complicated stuff, which is write a function that would actually crop each of these files in the list uh, with the that Portugal polygon. So we're going to write a function that will create a new uh, list, which is going to call forest heist rosters. And because we are applying this function to a list of objects, which is in our case, it's called forest height list. We do need to use again this L apply. So apply basically to a list. And after that, we are ready finally to write a function. So a function of X where X here is actually simply a variable that you define. So it doesn't need to be X. It can be Y, it can be VAR, it can be whatever you imagine. So we're going to crop. So that means that we need from Terra to use crop function. And then crop function will be applied to X in our case. And X in this case is forest height list. Uh, the second object is the vector or the polygon that you want to use to crop. And in our case, that's Portugal underscore SF. Now, uh, Terra likes to work with Terra friendly formats and X is already a raster format in the form of Terra or uh, a Terra friendly format because we actually loaded it using Terra, but Portugal SF is not, it's an SF object. So the easiest and the safest way that, uh, so it doesn't throw any warning is simply to use this Terra vect format. So just coerce it into a Terra friendly vector format. Now that we have this, there are two more things to do. And that is the first thing is we need to tell this Terra crop that we want to keep everything that is inside the polygon. So for that, you say snap equals in. And the last thing is you also want to tell Terra that everything is that is outside of the polygon should be declared as a now value and should not be then seen once we plot it. And for that, you just use mask equals true. And the last step is to create a mosaic. So we're going to be creating forest heights mosaic. And then over here, uh, we are going to actually uh, be uh, creating a single object from uh, the list of objects. So for that, we need to use do call because we do want to apply a Terra function, which is called mosaic to that list. But then we want 
that to be then a single object. So Terra Mosaic, and then we're gonna apply it to uh, this one here, Forest Fight Roster. So this is essentially going to, um, you know, collapse that list of single object, merge them together into a single mosaic, a single object, which is gonna be Forest Height Mosaic for, for Portugal. One thing you will notice if you inspect this newly created raster mosaic is that its dimensions are huge. So we're talking here about 62K by 40K pixels. So if you want to use this and then render a scene with ray shader, it's simply not going to work. Actually, it's going to fail and it's going to close your current R session. To prevent that, you then need to aggregate this. So basically, what aggregation means is you need to decrease the resolution. This is unfortunate because it's also going to affect the values that we have here. So the highest value of the tree height is not going to be any more 45 meters. It's going to be lower because exactly we're going to average some of the uh, raster cells by this aggregation. But it's really necessary. In this case, what I usually aim for is a value of 6 to 8k pixels. So for example here, if we have 62, which is the highest, uh, I would decrease this 10 times. So we get 6k by uh, 4k's. And this is exactly what we're going to do next. So we're going to create a new uh, object, which is going to be called Forest, uh, forest Heights Portugal. And then we're going to use this mosaic that we just created, put it into a pipe. And then Terra has an option for aggregating, which is called Terra Aggregates. So we're actually going to use Terra Aggregates. And then within Terra Aggregates, you can use option called Facts. Facts can be a single integer, which is then going to say Okay, I want both of those dimensions to decrease that many times. But you can also specify different integers for different uh, dimensions, uh, whether you want to decrease the number of columns, number of rows. If you want to visualize raster files in ggplot2 like we want, then you need to convert that raster file into a data frame. Data frame will hold information about the centroid of every pixel in your raster. So then in the resulting data frame, you will essentially have point coordinates and the value for that raster pixel. So it will then have three columns, X column for the longitude, Y column for the latitude, and the third one for the value. So we're going to be creating a new object or data frame, uh, which is going to be called Forest High Portugal DF. And this one is going to be the result of that previously aggregated Forest High Portugal. To convert a raster file into a data frame, you just use as data frame. Then here you specify that you want also the coordinates to be returned. As you can see, the resulting data frame has three columns, X, Y, and then the third column, which inherits the name of the last layer that was used in creating that, that raster file. So we want to change actually this name and we want to put something like height, for example. So to do that, you can just simply access the names of, uh, of this uh, Forest Height Portugal data frame. And then we know that the third column is the one that we want to change. So then you specify here number three, and then simply assign here the string that you want to uh, be the new name. So we can just call this height. Defining breaks for your plot is very important because then you can organize also the color values in a certain way. And for that purpose, I like to use the class and package, which offers you several optimization models or methods for creating breaks based on natural intervals. Natural intervals actually take a look at your data, see the distribution of your values, and based on that, they devise the breaks depending on the method that you choose. I really like using Jenks method, which actually really nicely uh, uh, deals with you know extreme values on both ends and allows you to come up with uh, you know very reasonable breaks. But in this case, we do have a lot of rows and Jenks then is not so good uh, because it is very, very small method. So what is usually suggested is using the Fisher method. 
So we're going to use that for creating breaks. First of all, calling this class in package. And then within class in package, there is class class intervals uh, function. So once we actually define this, the next thing is to say, what do we apply this to? Well, we apply to this newly created data frame and specifically the height column. This is what, for what we want to create bins. And then it says, okay, what is the number of bins? And I say here, I want five. So I usually tend to go between like, let's say five, five to eight, something like that. Everything above that uh, in my experience is that you won't really be able to discern the colors anymore. And then as I said, for the style, I'm just gonna go for Fisher here. And finally here, you need to also define uh, that you want to return the breaks object as a result from, from this function. Okay, so once we actually run this and we create breaks, uh, I think it's really in order to uh, also kind of inspect this object to see, okay, what are the breaks? So here are the breaks. It goes from 0 to 34. Remember, before we aggregated, 45 was, was the highest height of the forest. So this is simply the effect of aggregation, uh, which sometimes is necessary. It's a necessary evil. But one thing you will also notice, you remember we set uh, five breaks, but here it gives us six breaks. So that's something to also uh, be careful about, which is, yes, sometimes you uh, set a certain number, but depending on your data points, on the exact values, you might get you know the same or lower or higher number of breaks. In this tutorial, we'll be using a custom palette. Obviously, we're going to have dark green and green for those trees that are very high and then transitioning into contrasting colors that are a bit warmer, such as, for example, this yellow and pinkish and then ending with a white color, which basically is for trees that have no height or basically there is no there are no trees there at all. Now, the thing is, you will notice here we have only five values, but the number of breaks is six. So how do we actually increase more? Well. There is a trick here where we can interpolate among these colors and create even more. And for that, you can use color ramp palette. Color ramp palette over here, we just pass this calls. And after that, what we can do also is we can define the number of colors that we want to create. So we have six breaks. I'm just going to go for six. One more thing that you can also define within this one is what happens with this uh, higher levels of, of the colors, do they get shown or not? Usually what happens is, um, it happens that if you go to ggplot2, usually they have you know extremely high value, they're gonna only display this one. But there is an option here in color ramp palette, which is called bias. And the number here uh, that you choose, so the default one is one. So basically there's gonna be only one color at the end of the spectrum uh, that's gonna be shown. But for example, I want to, let's say, I want to have two green colors at the end of the spectrum. So I'm going to choose bias of two. If you want to have three at that higher spectrum, you can choose, you know, bias of three. So we're just going to go with bias of two. And now we're ready to uh, jump into ggplot2. Okay, so we are ready to write our codes. And we will first of all call ggplot in this case. In our case, the main data is forest height Portugal DF. And now we add the main layer. For plotting rasters, we use Geom Raster. Geom Raster is our main layer, which means that we need to define aesthetics. For every raster, you have three aesthetics. X, in our case, that's also X. Y, that's also Y. And the filling for the raster itself is managed by fill. In our case, that's height. Now that we have our main layer, we can then customize the colors that we want to use. And because here we're using a fill aesthetics, we need to use scale fill. And because our scale is continuous, we need to use, for example, either continuous or gradient. So we use the gradient one. Within this one, scale fill gradient, we can define, for example, what is going to be our title. So if you want to keep it blank, you can keep it like this. I would like to put heights and meters in brackets. After that, we can also define our colors. In this case, we can use the texture that we define. And finally, we can also add breaks to it. Uh, we have the breaks, but if you remember, our breaks are also have decimal places. 
Uh, in order to kind of uh, round those numbers, we can use a round function here and then just define zero decimal places after it. Also, one very good practice here is to define our chord SF. So basically, what are going to be the coordinates of, that we're going to use here? And this is defined using CRS. So because we're using WGS84, we can just put here 4326. Apart from these things, we can also customize the legend. For that, we use the guides argument in, um, uh, in ggplot2. And because we are here dealing with fill aesthetic, we need to say here that we are defining legend for the fill aesthetic. So fill equals guide legend. And then within this guide legend, you can do several things. One of them, you can define what is going to be the direction of your legend. In this tutorial, we would like the legend to be vertical since we are dealing with uh, height. And I also would like it to be on the right hand side. So those are the two things. One of these things we can already define. So direction equals vertical. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is we can also define what is going to be the size of those legend keys, right? How, what is going to be, you know, their height and their width. Here, because I'm going for a vertical legend, I would like them to be more or less, they would like to be the same. So this is managed by key height and key width. So for the key height, uh, we use unit here argument, and then within unit, we define what actually we want. So we want five millimeters, for example, and this is how it's how it's defined. Uh, in a similar way, you can also define this for, uh, you know, for the key width. As I said, they're gonna be the same size. So again, five millimeters. Apart from these things, you can also, for example, define where is your title gonna be. So title of the legend, is managed by title uh, dot position. So let's say I want it on the top. So descriptively, I can also define that, but I can also define the position of the legend labels. And this is managed by the argument label position. So for example, I want them on the right hand side. So I'm just gonna write here, right. Uh, apart from these things, you can also do, for example, you know, uh, horizontal justification of your title. So. What is going to be the horizontal justification? Is it going to be uh, left to right, justified, or maybe in the middle? So let's say we do it in the middle, and we also do it in the middle for the label as well. So those are some of the things that you can do. And, uh, you know, you can also, for example, define number of columns here you want, the one. You can also say, do not order them by row, uh, simply because, you know, we are here dealing with a vertical, uh, vertical legend. So once we define this, we can go ahead and define how the background of our plot is going to look like. And in ggplot2, to do that, you use the theme argument. Now, I usually like theme void because it gets rid of all everything in the background. But unfortunately, ray shader doesn't work well with this one. Uh, in fact, what it happens is that sometimes simply the, the, the background becomes black or it has some really weird stuff going on. So what I like to do, I like to, to use another theme, theme minimal. Unfortunately, theme minimal does not remove everything. So uh, it doesn't remove some of the grids and, you know, uh, then we need to actually deal with this manually. So anytime you want something to add to your theme, uh, you can just use theme argument and then within this brackets, you can define the things you want. Well, one of the things I want is I want access lines to be, uh, to get to remove, to be removed. So if you want to remove something in ggplot 2 you use element blank, whatever it is. So element blank is just like that. There are some other things that we want to remove. And one of them is uh, access titles. So access title uh, X is for the X axis. Again, I want that to be blank, but I also want to remove title for the Y axis. So I can do the same thing. I'm just going to say here, it's Y. Uh, in the same way, you might also want to remove those graticules on the sides, on the Y and the X axis, and also the degrees that they show. So you simply can uh, reuse uh, these two lines, but instead of uh, writing title here, you can just write text. This will remove text on both axes. There are some things that you don't necessarily want to remove, but you want to modify. And one of them is the legend position. And as I said before, I would like the legend to be on the right hand side. And I can just write here 
in the form of a string that it's on the right hand side. There are other things that you can also uh, change, for example, legend title. You can also customize the outlook of it. If you are dealing with text in ggplot2 and you want to customize it, then you need to tell ggplot2 that it's a text. So element text is the function for that. And here you can specify the size in pixels. So for example, legend title can be 11. It can also specify the color of the text. Let's say it's going to be charcoal gray. The same way you define legend title, you can also define legend text. And uh, legend text can be the same color, but we can, for example, choose a smaller size than it is. So for example, let's 10, 10 pixels. Apart from these things, we also want to uh, make the background the white because the default background in Ray Shader is also white. And we can start off, first of all, with plots or panel grids. So there are two grids, major and minor. So they are lines, so we need to tell here uh, ggplot2 that they are dealing with lines. And because lines are not filled, they're just colored, we just say here that color equals white. So the same way we did this is also to uh, do the minor, so we can also here define minor grid as well. There's also backgrounds. So there's something which is plot backgrounds and there is something which is also letter backgrounds and there is something which is panel background. So plot backgrounds and legend background, these are rectangles. So we need to tell also ggplot2 that they're rectangles and this is how you do it, element rect. So here, uh, rectangles and especially background ones are about filling. So we want to fill it with uh, white and we don't care about the border, so the color will be NA. So the same way they uh, think we did this for the plot background, we can also do for the ledger background as well, just like this. And then finally, we also want to control the border of the plot itself. So we don't want to have any edges there. And that also needs to blend into the background color. So uh, panel border, is also a rectangular or rectangular shape so we can just define here but with one exception here that we are not concerned with the fill we are concerned with the edges so the color will be actually white and as we define all these things there is one more thing that is very useful and that is playing with margins and actually decreasing that the white space around the margin so for that we can use plot margin argument this one is defined in units and for four parts of the world. So the top one is going to be equal zero. So we don't want anything expanding or shrink as is. Right hand side, bottom, and finally also left hand side. We set to zero. And here we also need to define uh, the main units. And for that, I just use lines. All right, now that we have this code, you should, once you run this, you should be able to get something like this. So a bit pale version of the matte, pale colors, but don't worry about that because once we pass this to Ray Shader, we'll also deal with shadows and lights, which will make uh, not only a 3D map, but also a prettier map in terms of those features. Ray Shader allows you to render scenes, even using ggplot objects. And for that, you can use the plotgg from Ray Shader to do that. The only thing you need to do here is, or the first and primary thing, is specify what is the name of your ggplot2 object. In our case, it's P. And then you can play with this and uh, specify different things. One of them is, for example, what is going to be the width and the height of your object. So, uh, here we are working with inches, and the way I like to specify width and height is by taking the exact values from that raster itself. So we can define h as our height, and the height is going to be based on the number of rows from that forest height Portugal that we previously created, while width, on the other hand, defined here as w, is going to be the number of columns also from this one. Now, this will return pixels, and as you remember, height is going to be 6.2k pixels and width is going to be 4.0k uh, pixels. Now, uh, here that means that we need to kind of readjust a bit because inches, this would be like a huge 
size in terms of inches. So what I like to do is simply divide this by 1000 and then I get more or less, you know, um, decent, you know, inches. So this is one of the things that you can specify here. Another thing that you can specify is the height of your spikes. And this is defined using scale arguments. Now, the default one is 115. We're going to follow it, but it's not so intuitive. You really need to render the scene to see, you know, how this looks like. I also like to add some additional customization options here. So for example, one of them is that I like to define the solid as equals false. So that would be that solid line around the panel of the plot. It doesn't always listen to me when I do that, but I try anyways to turn it off so that it doesn't look like it's on some kind of a panel. And also to declare the solid, uh, a solid depth of that panel is also equals zero. Now, some of these things you might also skip or you might actually define them differently. Feel free to do that. Other things is also shadow. If you set shadow to be false in this case, it means that you're going to render a dark scene without any shadows. But because we are here choosing shadow to be true, there's an additional parameter that it's very, very useful to define. And that is what is the shadow intensity? Shadow intensity goes from zero, it means a very strong shadow, to one very weak, almost non-existent shadow. So I'd like to put it closer to one, let's say 0.99. Apart from these things, um, I also like to define the offset edges parameter. In the past, I used to kind of uh, turn this on, uh, but um, sometimes uh, what it happens is that it also extrudes the edges of the, of the panel. So, um, and sometimes it happens that it also moves, offsets a bit the edges of the plot. So this time I'm just going to turn it off here and let's see how it actually uh, renders the scene, whether we still see those edge spikes. Other things that you can define here is the sun angle. Uh, of your light source and this is in degrees going from 0 to 360. Uh, the default here is 315 degrees which is basically uh, uh, this is northwest but you can change this of course play with this one and see what works for you. Um, you can also define the size of the window which is going to pop up after we run this code and we render the scene. Um, it can be defined as one or two values. I like to actually define as two values, 800 by 800 pixels for both the height and the width of the window. Other than that, you can also define the zoom levels. In Rayshader, they're also not so intuitive in a sense that the zoom out level is actually uh, one and the zoom in level the maximum one is zero. So I want to keep it somewhere in between, let's say 0.4. Uh, apart from that, you can also define the angle of your scene. So that would be uh, this phi, and phi in this case goes, you know, from zero to 90 degrees. Let's keep that angle uh, a bit sharp. So let's say around 30 degrees. Uh, theta is um, theta is the rotation uh, uh, rotation angle, and this one actually goes from minus. Uh, 180 to 180 so you can play with this one uh, a bit more uh, let's say for now we go with minus 30 uh, rotation angle and finally there are some other things that you can use for example uh, what I like to also turn on this this multi-core option so that it you know leverages the fact that I have more cores on my CPU and then which is gonna speed up the the process Okay, so this is the render scene. I'm not completely happy with it. I would like to have the view from the east towards the west of Portugal. Um, and also I would like to zoom out so that we see uh, completely the Portugal. Luckily for us, that's possible because Ray Shader has a render camera option which helps you uh, really quickly manipulate the scene. And if you're happy with it, then you can proceed on with actually rendering the object itself. So for that purpose, we can use a ray shader again and it's render camera option. In the render camera option, you can actually, you cannot play with all those features that we defined here, but some of them you can definitely change. One of them is, for example, this phi, 
which is the scene angle and we went for 30 degrees in the previous one i would like to increase it a bit to so get more of a bird's eye view so let's say we're going to go for 50 degrees angle and the zoom by default is um you know or actually by default is one but we in the previous scene we set to 0.4 which zoomed in a bit more uh, let's say we're going to zoom out a bit more and go with 0.7 and then finally, you can also choose the rotation angle of your scene, which is managed, as we said, by Theta. It was minus 30, but that actually led us to have the view from the east towards, or actually, sorry, from the west towards the east. We want it in reverse. We want it from the east towards the west. So I'm going to go for Theta, which is positive value, and set as 45 degrees. Looks much better. At least now we see the entire Portugal. And we also change the angle so we're now looking from the east towards the west remember that our light source is going to be northwest so the light is going to come towards us once we render the scene we are happy with it we can go ahead and render and save the object on our drive using the ray shader and specifically its function to render high quality to save on your local drive you need to here specify the file name in the stream format and you need to specify apart from the name also your extension i like to go for png files so i specify that here for the name we can simply say uh, portugal let's say forest height 2020 and after that there are some generic options that you can define one of them is whether you want to have the preview of the rendering window itself I do like to monitor the progress. I usually put here true. Uh, Ray shader also allows you to move uh, the scene itself as it renders, but because it's very resource intensive, if you do that, it might actually lead to the crash of your session. So interactive is the argument that manages this and I keep it at false value. Um, one of the most important things here is of course the lights. So here in ray shader we can define several things related to light first of all whether there's going to be any light on the scene or not if there is no light so if light equals false then your scene is going to be dark in our case we want to have the light in our scene so the next obvious question is what is going to be the, the uh, light direction in terms of degrees what is going to be the light intensity and finally what is going to be the light attitude Let's start off with the first one, which is light direction. So light direction is in degrees. It goes from zero to 360 degrees. And um, we already defined the sun angle of our scene, which is 315 degrees. So we should go for a light direction, which is a similar thing. Except for one thing is I, I would like the light direction to be not only one. I want to add multiple light directions. So we can also play with that. This doesn't mean that you only have one light direction. In fact, if you define here a list, you can define multiple. So the way I like to go about this, I like to define four light uh, directions, but each of them is not going to be, you know, completely unique. So one of them is going to be, let's say, 315 degrees, and the other one can be very close to it so that we have a concentrated source of light from one side. But then I would go ahead and actually repeat those uh, degrees here so that we have more concentration from two sources that are very close to each other. Now, after we do this, uh, we can also define what is going to be the intensity. And this is here we can actually play with lights. So light intensity. We have four sources. A ray shader allows you here to, let's say, define only one light intensity. But let's say I want to have multiple. Let's say, for example, for these two, first two, I'm going to have a very uh, strong light intensity that goes over 1000 value. So let's say, for example, that these two are going to be 1000 and 1500 each. This one, of course, these values are not intuitive. They're not real measures. Uh, again, it takes time to kind of a uh, rendering object to see what actually works for you. Anyways, so let's have two very strong light sources coming from two different light directions. And then let's have two very weak. Let's say those that are almost like there are 10% strength of these. So 150 and 100. Now, 
For now, we have actually only two light directions and we have four light intensities. But if we want to create a, like a special effect here, let's say, for example, we want a light to go through those forests and come, you know, on the other side towards us, we can play also with light altitude. The higher the light altitude you choose, the stronger will be the light. In other words, the bigger area will be covered. So here again, what we can do, we can specify four light altitudes, but following the light direction, we can follow the same pathway. In a sense, we can specify two light altitudes, but multiply them by two. So in a sense, we can have, for example, for those very strong lights, we can have a very small degree. A very small degree here would actually, the effect would be the following. It's going to be a very strong light, so it's not going to go over the entire scene. It's going to go over a very low angle, which will allow for that effect where light goes through the forest. So here we define two very small uh, angles, very small degrees, so 15 and 15, and then very high. Uh, the highest one would be 90 degrees, but we're going to go for something like 80 degrees, for example. So this is the effect I want to see. I want to see that strong light uh, with a very small angle, basically creating this effect as if the light goes through the forest and ends up on the other side. So these are the things that we can define. Another thing that you can define is also what is going to be the material of the, uh, of the ground itself. And this is uh, managed by ground material. Now, Ray renderer so another package here that is a dependency of ray shader and that is loaded when you load ray shader uh, has one really cool feature which is called micro facet so micro facet here um, allows you with this option roughness to choose how rough your material is going to be so if you choose very small values uh, roughness is actually gonna so here you can actually see the default one is very very small it's very close to zero so everything closer to zero makes it smoother everything closer to one make it makes it more diffuse or rough so for example if you choose something that is from zero to uh, 0 0.01 that's something like a, a you know uh, uh, like a metal a very very I would say nicely like smooth metal if you choose something that is uh, goes until 0.1, then it's more brushed metal. Then 0.1 to 0.3, it's like a rough metallic surface. And if you go like everywhere from 0.3 to 0.5, that's like a more diffuse. And everything above 0.5 is going to be like a satin, this velvet. So this is exactly what we're going to go for. We're going to play a bit here. I'm going to choose roughness at 0.6. I want this forest to have this velvet satin like. Uh, look so let's have a try all right and then at the end once we're done with all this customization you can also choose the width and the height of your plots and here i don't necessarily follow what already exists so i go just like for some pixels with the same uh width and height 4000 but oftentimes i go even higher let's say 8000 uh by 8000 pixels because i want to really really crisp it. All right, you can definitely play with this, see what works for you. And once you're happy with this, you can run this code and start this rendering. And here it is, the forest height map of Portugal. You can see how this thing is so nicely fluffy. And you can also see how it transitions from quite a low forest height in the lower parts of Portugal and then transition into higher and it peaks somewhere here in the middle but it's also remains pretty pretty high in in North Portugal so this is how you make this map obviously there are so many other things that you can improve here one of them of course is the color another one is the texture you want to achieve here but also maybe the perspective uh, that you want to take a different angle perhaps or a different rotation it's definitely up to you uh, as well as the colors and shadows and position. So everything's up for grab. It's definitely up to you and your creativity how you want to shape this. In today's tutorial, we created a forest height map of Portugal, and I showed you how you can also do that for any other regional level. 
I'm really, really curious how you use this tutorial to take it on a journey across the world to create your own forest site maps. If you are interested in replicating this analysis, I prepared a link to the GitHub repo in the description below. If you have any comments, questions, or just general feedback, feel free to reach out to me here on YouTube, but also on Instagram and Twitter. If you're new to R and you seek to expand your knowledge of data visualization and geospatial analysis with R, this is the place to be, and I prepared a few tutorials for you. See you next time.